So, like I said, my name is Darylin, and I am the um, one of the new counselors in the Counseling Center. And I may know some of you, but I don't may not know all of you. So I just want to introduce myself, tell you a little bit about me. I am um, actually a graduate of Highline, first generation college student. Um, went to UW for under, undergrad and grad school, and I'm a current doctoral candidate at Smith College for clinical social working, <laughs> clinical social work. And I am just so happy to be um, part of Highline, to be part of the team, and to account it a privilege and an honor to be able to work with students and to support you during some of the most challenging times in your life. I um, don't take it lightly and I, I really value the time um, that you that you allow me to be to be in your presence. So today, oops, sorry. sorry. So today we're going to be talking about social connections um, during physical um, distancing and really thinking about depression. And so we're going to be talking about um, a few. Oops, excuse me. It's not working. want to um, just share with you what we're going to be talking about today to give you a brief outline. We're going to be talking about the definition of depression and we're going to be looking at um, triggers for depression, um, thinking about our thoughts, our behaviors, um, how depression impacts our thoughts, our behaviors, our emotions, and even our bodies, and some common symptoms of depression. Um, as well as how, how can we manage it? How do we take care of ourselves during this time? And specifically thinking about while social distancing or, or social isolation, how are we able to um, still um, keep those connections with the people who are um, important to us? So we're gonna start off with just talking about what depression is. And um, you're more than welcome in the Q&A to just kind of add your own thoughts about how you would describe depression for yourself or in the community, anything like that you want me to um, read and share towards the end of the presentation, I can do that. Um, but a lot of people describe it in different ways and depending on like your experience, you'll have a different definition. And so for the purpose of this conversation, I just wanted to provide a definition that I think is pretty helpful and it's one that, um, that I um, often share when I'm working with people. Um, and it looks at the way like our emotions, our thoughts and behaviors, how, um, and physical, how all these ways are impacted by depression. Before I give you this example or definition of depression, I wanted to just talk about how common it really is, right? And so it's often considered as the common cold of mental health concerns. Right, um, a lot of people experience it. A lot of college students experience depression. Um, one third of Washington State college students um, identified that they have experienced depression within the last year. And this came from a study that was done in 2016, 2017, where um, more than 10,000 students here in Washington State at both two year and four year college um, two-year and four-year colleges were asked the question, and this is what they answered. So it tells us that you're, if you're experiencing this, you're absolutely not alone, and it is, um, it's very common. The next thing I wanted to share with you about depression is that 47% um, reported negative mental health effects um, resulting from this pandemic, from the current um, pandemic that we're going through. So um, Kaiser Family Foundation, they did a, a tracking poll and this was completed March 25th to March 30th of this year. So right when we were starting to really see the impacts of this um, virus here in the United States. Um, and it was 47% of those who were um, engaged in sheltering in place reported negative mental health effects resulting from worry or stress related to this virus. 
So again, we share this information with you. I'm sharing this information so that you um, can understand that it's a common experience and you are not in it alone. Um, and especially want you to know that because oftentimes depression leads us to feel like we are the only ones going through this, um, this trying time. So let's move to this definition that I like to share about depression. Um, it's when normal feelings like being sad, down, grumpy, or irritable are very intense and they go on for too long and they get in the way of, um, of normal life. And for normal life, it's however you define what that is for you. Um, depressed feelings happen to everyone, um, sometimes especially after a loss or disappointment. So when we think about it, when, um, when these symptoms or when depression symptoms happen too much and interfere with our life, like getting in the way of doing things that we want to do or things that we, um, are, we need to do, that's when it's a really um, a, a good time to think about how can I get some help to address this? Because we all get sad, we all have these, um, we all may experience some depressive symptoms, but your measurement once you should be around what is getting in my way? Is it no longer, am I no longer able to do the things that are important to me and that I am responsible for? And if that's the case, then that's a great time to reach out for support. And we'll talk more about some ways to do that as we continue. So I also want to share just a little bit around uh, depression triggers. And um, these are some things that you may have experience with, or if not personally, maybe um, someone really close to you. So um, things turning out badly in the way that you didn't want or a way that you didn't expect can definitely be a trigger for depression. Lack of neurotransmitters in our brain. So like there's a physical response in our brain that can impact depression. Um, not getting what we've worked super, super hard for. Um, losing relationships. Um, and this can be by death or it can also be um, by just like breakups or um, loss in general, losing independence, losing um, experiences. All of those can definitely be triggers for depression. Um, feeling rejected or being excluded from community, from group, from schools, from friends, from families, from society, all of those things impact um, mental health. And then reading about other people's problems and our troubles in the world, you know, so just being empathetic and being concerned for other people can sometimes be a trigger for depression. Um, some more I would like to share are, if you've had a previous um, episode of depression, um, it, it does increase the risk and it increases the risk for you to have another depression uh, episode. If you have a family member who's had experiences with depression, that can definitely impact you. Um, I mentioned like being sensitive or emotional or empathetic towards people. Um, if you've experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of uncertainty in your childhood, that can be, um, that can definitely increase the risk for depression. And then biological females, the um, studies show like just the increase of, uh, of hormones and the fluctuation of things, all those things really impact depression. Um, and we're having this presentation, this time to talk with you, specifically thinking about depression during this time of the pandemic and thinking about COVID-19. And so we think about that, like these, these, um, these triggers that are mentioned here are, um, you know, think about that in terms of also prevalent and important during COVID-19. So having a previous diagnosis of depression, you know, especially during this time, one of the things that you may want to do if you have um, been in depression is to stop like your treatment or just no longer go to counseling or no longer take medication. And if you have previously been diagnosed, it's a great time to continue your process of healing and continue your journey. So whatever your treatment plan was prior to, to really commit to that. 
um, there's a great increase of um, in unemployment going on right now in regards to the pandemic. So that is also a risk um, for depression. Um, lack of access to our supportive communities, um, faith-based communities, whatever it is that, are, that you feel a part of and you're no longer having the capacity or the, um, the ability to be able to meet with, with people. Um, fear about, um, I'm sorry, increased racism and discrimination. Um, uh, Nicole's talked about, and I believe, um, I think yeah, Nicole talked about just all of um, the just activities and violence that is going on in communities of color um, right now and how that, even if it doesn't happen to you personally, being a member of community with a um, identity situated in those communities impacts your mental health. And so just to be mindful that we, you know, unfortunately don't get the privilege of being able to just go through one traumatic event at a time. Oftentimes it's very complex and um, layered. And so we're dealing with pandemic, but not outside of normal systemic racism that occurs, or I don't even know if it's normal, but the, the racism that occurs, um, and how that impacts um, everybody, and especially our mental health. Um, having fear of contracting um, the virus for yourself and family, for community members, all of those things actually are, um, they impact us as well. And then the shelter in place requirements, that's asking us to um, maybe not go the places we normally go when we're having a hard time or being able to physically be in the presence of people. Um, all these things are triggers and they are real and um, you're not alone if you are experiencing some of these um, symptoms or triggers. So I want to share a little bit about the common um, the common symptoms, physical symptoms of depression. It's important to be mindful of these things when we're thinking about how to care for ourselves and how to care for our, the people that we care about and the people who we love. If we are aware of the symptoms, if we can um, know when we should make adjustments or reach out for help and support. So some of those physical symptoms to be mindful about are um, if your appetite has changed, um, a, a fluctuation in your weight, increase or a rapid decrease, those things I want you to be mindful of. If it's difficult for you to think, you're just moving very slow, slower than you have like normally, um, or your speech, like these things you want to be mindful of. If it's hard for you to feel, if you feel just really numb, those are some physical symptoms. Energy reduction, fatigue, sleeping too much or sleeping not enough, okay? Um, psychological symptoms with depression, um, there's definitely a risk for suicide and suicidal ideations. Um, so if that is something that you're experiencing and, and or you're aware of your friends or families are experiencing, that is um, something we really want to be mindful of and to reach out for support so that we can, be, we can help you during that time. There's also thoughts of worthlessness, um, a decreased interest in doing the things that once were very pleasurable for you. Um, and then you're, it's just really hard, maybe it's really hard to be able to focus on schoolwork or take care of um, studying or making decisions, all those things. These are the most common symptoms, both physical and psychological for depression. So as we talk about it, we're telling you about it, just not just to let you know what depression is, but then also to let you know that it's, it's actually very treatable and that um, with the right, being able to reach out and get support and start interventions that, you know, mental health recovery is always possible. And so we wanna give you or some ideas of things that you can do to manage um, symptoms of depression. Um, We've shared actually now throughout all the presentations about the importance of being able to move your body, to exercise, um, to help just to get your blood flowing, to 
uh, decrease stress in your body, to increase endorphins. Like it's so important to be able to move your body. It also can be helpful, maybe reading, um, meditation, prayer, all of these things can be helpful. Um, and we think it, it's still, it's very important still to be able to get out of the house. So that does that may not mean during this time that you're able to go um, to the places and be around all the people that you normally would be around. But think about, can I go outside of my house for a walk, for a break? Can I, um, you know, just get out, do something? Um, to see if that is helpful. Also things that are helpful during this time is to give yourself the permission to slow down. And what that might look like, especially as being students, is like if you have the capacity or if your program and your, um, your class schedule allows to take less classes, maybe this is the time to explore that. Or work with your advisor to figure out what class can I take that won't be won't be as stressful during this particular time. So really giving yourself the grace to take a break as you can, because um, we do understand that everybody doesn't have the privilege to just stop going to school. But just seeing, is there a way that I can take care of myself and do the things that I need to do? Um, another thing is important to stay informed, um, but also manage your news and media outlets. So really be particular about um, what's helpful for you and what isn't helpful. And um, sometimes just having facts versus, um, you know, not facts uh, is helpful to know like the truth about what's happening, what's going on. It may be able to um, decrease some anxiety and uh, fears and depression. Um, and to use, have a routine. So a routine is not, it may not be your normal, your routine that you do, that you used to do. Um, just having the space to try something different, to create a new routine for you and sticking to that can be very helpful. Um, and then limit alcohol and drug use if that's, um, if you're able to do that. Um, I think of ways that you can cope with the um, depression and or anxiety in ways that will um, feel your body and help you to uh, feel good. Okay. So those are just some of the tips and things that we are, that we'd like to share with you about how to manage depression. And I'm curious to see what else you have, what's been working for you. Um, even if you're not able to share that here, but just be thinking about what's worked for you in the past, what's working for you now, and what adjustments have you had to make, um, to be really intentional about that because you absolutely um, have the capacity to care for yourself, and we are here to help you when you need support, um, and that might be now, and we are definitely available for you. So the last thing I kind of want to share or begin to share with you is this discussion around social distancing versus physical distancing. So like in our state, we are being asked to participate in social distancing. This is to keep our bodies safe, to decrease the spread of the virus. It's extremely important and necessary during this pandemic. Um, as we consider the nature of humans, like just being a human being and the power of language, one thing I would like all of us to, like to encourage all of us to do is to um, think about this time as not a time of like socially distancing ourselves, but maybe physically distancing. So we're not able to be in that face, that space physically, but we are trying to be creative and um, really think outside of the box on how can we still maintain social connections. They are extremely important and extremely important in regards to depression. Um, one of the major triggers as well as symptoms is this isolation and being alone and feeling alone like no one else is there. So one of the things that's super important is being able to have community and connect with your community. And that may be different um, than what we are used to. So 
just to think about what has, have you found to be helpful? Some creative ways. Um, Josh has talked about um, maybe on TikTok. Like I found that I, I enjoy TikTok. I can't do the dances, but I like to watch them. And um, some other creative ways, maybe FaceTime or Duo if you don't have an iPhone. Um, other video formats to still stay connected and have like that face-to-face, -face, but virtual face-to-face -face connections. Um, letter writing, I know that's throwback, but it really can be nice um, to get a card or a letter in the mail is, is pretty awesome, especially during this time, maybe texting people, calling people, um, maybe go on physical distancing walks. Um, or for my husband's birthday this year, we did a parade for him um, because we weren't going anywhere for his birthday, but I was able to have people come by, drive and honk and show signs or carry signs for him. And that was just a really good time, you know? So think creatively about ways to still connect with the people who feel you, um, who, who just, your people, your, your, who makes you feel better about who you are and what you're going through. So though you don't want to cut off those people from your lives, especially during extreme times of crisis. So when we're thinking about this time, it is a very challenging time for a lot of people. And if you are one of those people, like I've said several times today, that you are definitely not alone. And so we want you to really focus on giving yourself grace and offering grace to others. Give yourself the grace to not be what you may describe as your best during this time, right? Like not comparing it to non-pandemic times. Like I was able to do all my assignments in two hours before this happened. And now I'm just no good because it's taking me eight hours or it's taking me several days. So to give yourself the grace that you deserve in terms of just being human and trying to figure out this new way of life, this new season, this time right now, and then also offering that same level of grace as you have the capacity to do so to other people. Um, and to listen to others, listen to yourself, and then also listen to your friends, your family, um, if they need support or an ear, someone to talk to. Um, but always being mindful of what you have the capacity to do. Under no circumstance are you required to bear the burdens of others if you don't have the space to do so. So if you, you know, don't have the capacity, you can always refer your friends to counseling and even refer yourself. Um, there's other places, there's doctors, um, nurse practitioners, naturopaths, um, acupuncturists, these are all areas of place and places for healing, even faith communities. So please just reach out to spaces, people, things that you find that have been helpful for you in the past and that may be helpful for you during this time. So I just wanted to end with this definition again around depression, right? So it's a normal thing. We all have sadness. We all have trouble at work, trouble at home. Um, all these, these things happen to us. And, and we're not saying you have depression or there's something wrong with you. But if, if your feelings and your emotions get in the way of you being able to live the life that you want to live, then that is a great time to reach out and we are here to support you. So um, going to transition to if you have any questions or comments that you would want to share and Gloria is gonna join me on the screen and um, we are available to answer any questions you have. Darylin, I have one question for you. Yeah. Do you have do you have a favorite book or website 
um, that you would recommend to students or to anybody who just wants some other ideas? Hmm. Website that I recently went on, I feel like it was, actually, I don't know off the top of my head. Hmm. I went on like the CDC, they were helpful. I don't usually go on websites, um, but the CDC had some pretty good information and the Kaiser Family Foundation, they had some good resources too, um, like thinking about depression, especially during these times with like, you know, the COVID outbreak. Okay, I just thought maybe students might wanna know where to, where to go to get more. Mm -hmm. And if you do want more, you can just like schedule a time with us too, because we can sit down and look together what might be a good fit. Um, some of the apps that I like to use is um, there's uh, Elevate. Where's my cell phone? Um, yeah, some there's some apps that I could share too. Give me a moment while we look for other uh, questions. I don't see any more, do you, Gloria? Yeah, I don't see any other questions, too. Maybe um, the other counselors could um, join us and we could just transition to other general questions from any of the three presentations and, and go from there. Sounds good. So, so welcome, if I didn't see you earlier at 12. Um, my name is Nicole Wilson. I am one of the counselors in the Counseling Center. And I think we have Tom and Josh might jump on as well. Cool. I don't know if this is working. I'm Tom. My own video seems to be frozen, but here I am, ask away. I see one question here that was asking about apps and there's a couple that are my favorite. There's one that's the Calm app and it has different meditations. Um, there's also the Safe Place app. There's the Liberate Meditation app. And then for children, there's the, there's the Mind Yeti. Mind Yeti. I'll type all these in I'll the Q&A. I'll type all these in the q &A. Maybe if another counselor can ask the, answer this question, there's a question that says, you said depression's really treatable. What are some of the ways that the counseling office addresses depression? Maybe if one of you can answer that and I'll answer the, the uh, app question. Do you wanna... Let me, yeah, I'll, I'll take a uh, uh, try at that. So um, usually when I talk with someone about their depression, I really ask them how that shows up in their body. Um, about, I talk with them about their energy level, about you know, uh, how, how they're experiencing depression, and then also about what's been going on in their life right now so that we can figure out um, how much of uh, their depression is due to just situational kinds of things or environmental kinds of things that we might be able to, to tweak um, a little bit easier. Um, also, the way that we perceive or look at things, um, you know, impacts how we feel. So um, I try to help, help people look at different ways to look at a situation 
or another way to kind of interpret what's happening in front of them. Um, and then sometimes um, I need to refer people for um, a medication evaluation because their body's just too sluggish. Um, if they're not sleeping, you know, through the night or, you know, or they just can't get out of bed in the morning to get to school or work. Those are times when we might consider, you know, checking with their doctor or nurse practitioner, or I can give them a referral for that. And then we try to try to work with the physical and the, the mental and um, emotional parts together. So, um, so I think, you know, as, as Daryl stated and some other folks too, um, usually I try to go for things that are low cost and easy first, like moving your body um, or exercise and then um, kind of looking for pleasurable activities in your life, um, uh, trying to do some quick fixes and then see where we are at that point. So, so it just kind of depends on the person and the situation and um, what we do, um, it, it can vary anywhere from a little bit of bibliotherapy, reading something, to exercise, to uh, meditation, to reframing or relooking at things. It, it just, it just kind of depends. Um, so that's how I address um, depression with people. But other people, maybe other counselors, have some other um, ways they. Uh, work with folks who have those symptoms. So maybe maybe Tom or Darling could join in too. Um, yeah, I, I agree with all of what you shared. Um, one thing I would add is that I sometimes people um, haven't they've been through a lot of challenging things in their life and they haven't had the space um, to just acknowledge it and say, you know, actually this has been really hurtful and this has been really painful. And so um, as a clinician, I, it's my job to be able to sit there and to listen and to hold and to be able to give you the validation that sometimes people haven't received and they've received a, and experienced a lot of things that have been really painful and that they haven't let out. So it just all stays inside um, and impacts their mood and their ability to even think about things in a different type of way. Um, so that's another component that, um, that happens sometimes when working with people who are experiencing depression. Mm -hmm. I can add, and maybe Tom wants to jump, jump in. Um, everything that you said is, is brilliant for both of you. And, what I love about working with students is that we get to find out what works for you. And so we're always in partnership. We're going to try something, talk about it. Did this work? No? Okay. Um, but it's building that relationship that oftentimes a lot of the healing can get to, right? It's just someone you can process. It may be holding on to things. Sometimes the way that we talk to ourselves, we would never talk to anybody else, right? So it's really thinking, like having a moment to to think about the ways in which we, the messages that we give ourselves. And sometimes that's questioning, where did those come from? And are they even fair? Are they right? And, and if we could start thinking about how we talk to ourselves, sometimes that's a first step. But again, depression, you know, it, it has a lot of different, um, as Daryl mentioned, a lot of different causes, right? And it impacts all different parts of our body. Sometimes we embody that physically, emotionally it comes out differently for all of us so that means that the way in which we address it is going to be individual to you i'm not sure what i could possibly add to all of that uh, all of my colleagues know exactly what they're doing and they do it very well the Short answer though is that it's actually much easier to come in and try it and experience it and see if it works for you than it is to try to get an explanation about how it happens. Uh, the, the proof is really in the pudding and I would, I would encourage anyone who is considering it to come on in and have a conversation. It is, uh, it is hopefully painless and hopefully can be uh, very much of a relief. 
and it's it's a uh, counseling can be a really great tool and it's not nearly as scary as it seems i want to echo that tom the the scariest part is making the appointment it gets easier from there right just get through that there's another question we have um, for the panel is basically how do you deal with people with difference of opinion people who maybe are taking more risks around COVID than you are how do you deal with like just family conflicts around this friendship conflicts relationship conflicts around how we choose to keep ourselves safe and different philosophies and of course I'm guessing politics are a piece of that too so yeah, I'm just gonna read the question and let my beautiful colleagues answer it. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I think the first place, so I'm gonna start and we're all just gonna build on this. Okay. Um, the first place I probably would start with is um, even where I shared with offering grace, right? Um, I think that's probably where I would start, you know, in my situation. I don't know if the details around like um, the person who asked the question. So again, like what Nicole said, it's very, it's going to be very specific to like your family, your experiences, and we can talk further about that. But for me, starting would definitely be from the space of offering grace and understanding that a lot of people, everybody is going through this and a lot of people have different reactions and different responses um, to how they deal with trauma. And, and it can sometimes appear that they're just not getting it. Like, why, don't, what, why aren't you paying attention? Why aren't you doing the same things that I'm doing to keep myself safe? Like, I don't understand where you're coming from. But people process and deal with things in different ways and we don't really have uh, we can't really control people to do the things that we want them to do and sometimes that's the hardest thing is to being able to recognize that and recognize what is it actually pulling up in me right so if i'm seeing people not wearing their mask or not taking this seriously what is that what anxiety is that raising in me what are the feelings that are associated in that for me? And those, we can explore that because that's what we have access to. That's what we have control over. And it's not really the way that other people process or don't process um, different process situations. That's where I would start. You know, I, I like that um, approach. And I would add to that that um, I, I really think of that as um, that situation as a, a test for myself in terms of how independent and assertive I can be, um, which means I have to think about what, what am I willing to risk or what's, what's my level of anxiety to begin with. Um, and then with the facts that I can read, you know, from the CDC, from the Department of Health, you know, what, what's the advice I'm being given from experts and decide for myself what I'm willing to do and not do. Um, and then kind of from there, how do I, once I decide what I'm willing to do, it is about being assertive. It is about saying what I need to do for me is this. And you can, you know, it's okay, you're going to do what you're going to do, but I need to be making this choice right now for this reason. And um, and so it's solidifying what your limits are, what your boundaries are, what, what you're willing to, um, I guess what you're willing to risk. And so if, if a client came to me with that or a student came to me with that issue, I'd say, well, what, where is your line? And then what, what words do you wanna use to, um, or to tell your message um, or say what your your boundaries are. Um, and sometimes I help students come up with um, language to use that might work for them. Although they're probably going to change it to use their own language, um, at least I can suggest some words they might use or some um, uh, language um, and then we kind of go from there. But um, I think that is such a difficult one because everybody has a different comfort level around 
how close they want to be or how much they want to, you know, uh, wear a mask or whatever. So, so it is about what Darlin said about giving yourself and other people some grace, but not letting people walk all over you if you feel like you need personally a little more space or a little more something. Uh, so that's kind of how I'd answer that question. I can add too, I, I think to both of your points and to Darlin specifically, asking ourselves, what is that bringing up in me? And so I get hyper vigilant when I'm anxious, right? So I might get really irritable if someone's not wearing a mask around me, right? And then I remember what do I have in my, what's in my control and what's not. So, you know, I can back up, I can ask for space in the grocery store. I, you know, I, I can wear a mask. I can shop at a time, you know, I'm lucky enough to do that. Like I have the ability to, sh to shop at early in the morning or um, in a less busy time. Um, and I am also, you know, thinking about being a parent and how we always have to catch our kids doing something good, right? So I try to catch good behavior and acknowledge that too. Um, I'm trying to spend some time like just giving a little bit more kindness. So when I see our essential workers um, in the grocery store, just thank you for being here. I'm trying to wear a mask to give you some space. How can we support you? And then that tends to be um, contagious. And so other people start to be able to, to hear that too and go, oh yeah, let me, let me step back a little bit. So I'm, I'm trying to just name the good behavior, try to be extra kind, and then also try to just realize what's going on for me and what can I control. I love that, Nicole. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think it's very difficult to give sort of broad general answers to this because the, the person who asked this question is talking about people who are friends and family. And of course, the, the real answer for how to manage a situation like that depends in part on what that relationship is and, and how, how it is managed between the people who are in it. Um, so, and the truth is, unfortunately, that, you know, while, while the person who's asking the question might be seeking to have a, a real discussion about this without triggering a conflict, we don't know anything about the motivation of the other person. They may, in fact, be looking for conflict, right? There's a lot, unfortunately, a lot of people in this high-stress time in our history right now who are actually spoiling for a fight. And so... Figuring out, you know, what is what is the the motivation and the role of the other person in a conflict is actually essential to how this question gets answered, and what is the nature of that relationship, and how much choice and power do you have in terms of how much you're going to interact with this person? If this is a neighbor that you can kind of say see you later to, that's one thing. But if it's someone that you're sharing a household with or a bedroom with that's a much tougher situation to untangle in terms of how you're going to manage yourself. And so uh, again, <laughs> I would sort of recommend have this conversation with one of the members of the, the counseling team in, in one-on-one -on -one conversations because the, the context and relationships are going to make a huge difference in how this gets disentangled and dealt with. I also see another question that's asking, can we only ask about depression and anxiety? Nope, this is your chance. We may not be able to answer more than that, but no, we will. <laughs> you know, around mental and emotional health, absolutely. Counseling services, yes. We might be able to uh, figure out how to, to, to help you navigate the college system of Highline, sure. But yeah. We know the numbers right. for the lottery, that we don't know. No. <laughs> In fact, I'm just learning how to use this Zoom uh, platform. So if you were with me at noon, you, you found that out. So um, lots of grace all around. So until we get another question, I did want to just ask the, the panelists here, um, what's worked for you? <laughs> like, 
in dealing with this? Like any strategies um, that we can share and then we can get some from our, our, our attendees as well. I, I think I'd like to answer that. You know, um, what has worked for me is just remembering that it's really typical um, of people, including myself, to go from moments of being really, really anxious and really, really kind of depressed about what the outlook is um, to being more hopeful at times. And that even in a day, I kind of circle through all of those um, feelings or all of those um, different points. And when that happens, um, I I just remind myself that that's the way it is for most of us. We can handle a little bit of, um, you know, what's going on, and then it becomes a little overwhelming. Um, and then we can draw back and feel like, oh, okay, I've got some tools to go forward. Um, I can handle this. I can manage this. And I, I think we all are doing that in some way, shape, or form these days. Uh, so. I just try to remind myself when I'm in one of those places that um, it's not going to be, I'm not going to be there very long. I can remind myself there's another, another perspective and, um, and it's typical to go back and forth a few times, you know, um, that's what I'd add. That and I take out the recycling and garbage just so I can get a short walk a lot more than I used to. Um, because, hey, you know, it's good to get out of the house and it's good to see a little sunlight. And um, so I think that's been helpful. Cups of tea. I've become a really big tea fanatic. Um, I was before, but now it's probably increased a bit. Um, and I've tried to do, um, as Nicole um, mentioned in one of her previous workshops, I've tried to do some creative things like um, like paint or write a song or do, you know, just do something um, that requires a little bit of creative energy. That helps. I have been... Um, um, I have been, for one, seeing my therapist, very important. Um, now, the other thing that I've been doing is I've been trying to get outside, like go on walks. And um, I do walk like with some, like with my husband, I, that makes me feel the safest right now. So I'll do that and walk up um, hills. Um, and I'm really practicing right now in giving myself grace to just not feel okay on some days. That, like Gloria said, like there's ups and downs. And even though we're on this panel and even though we are um, like mental health experts, we're human and we are experiencing this with you and trying to figure it out too. So um, I've been doing a lot of Zoom calls or FaceTiming with my, with my niece, with my brothers. Um, all, all those things have been really helpful, really trying to stay connected. That's all for me. I can add a few things. Um, I've started out, I, I really appreciate, Darlene, how you were talking about, and, and Gloria, about there are just some days that you have to give yourself grace that aren't great. I found that at the beginning, Monday through Friday were okay because I had a schedule, right? And it's easy for me to be attentive to other people or to my work than to, so Saturdays, and it used to be my favorite day, ended up being kind of hard, you know? So um, a good friend of mine, uh, she's just funny and, and good to be around. So at 11 o'clock on Saturdays, it's we walk and talk. Right? So I have to go for a walk and so does she. That means I have to get up out of bed. Right? It means I have, have to have eaten. I have to get dressed and get ready. Um, and then it's something I look forward to. And then it just that a little bit of endorphins. I walk a mile, it's not that long, you know? But a, a little bit of endorphins allow me to get through the rest of the day. So when I come back to my family, I'm in a, at a better mood, right? Like and I'm ready to be present. Whereas I think the first Saturday, I probably stayed in bed for most of Saturday, 
you know, like it just was a day. So that's been really helpful for me. The other piece is um, I have a hammock and I have a rocking chair. And both of those things, like when we're feeling dysregulated, <laughs> like think about when you're a baby and you're rocked by your mom or your parents or your grand, you know, whatever, your family member, it's just soothing. Or even when you're stressed, do you, if you find yourself kind of rocking to just kind of self-soothe. So I'm literally rocking myself. So at night I go in my hammock, I look at the stars, I put a blanket up um, and rock. And that helps me to get um, to a place where I can sleep. So that's been really helpful. Um, and also a lot, most therapists have therapists. So <laughs> shout out to our therapists. <laughs> You know, walking creates that same rocking sensation too. So if you don't have a hammock or something, just moving your body like that is, can create that same soothing sensation. <laughs> now we're all doing it. Yeah. And it's catchy, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, <laughs> that's right, that's the point about walking. Well, I'm, I've been, uh, it's my normal coping strategy too, not just for COVID times, but I, I, I rock by playing music and that's, uh, and anyone can do it. Even if you're not an instrumental person, you can sing and any, any amount of creative stuff as Gloria was, was referencing is, you know, it's, it's just good medicine and, we all have access to it in, in our own capacity. Um, I've been walking too. I'm, I'm, I'm an introverted person. So this is, a, you know, it's kind of a weird time. I see people posting on the internet out like, ooh, introverts, we were built for this. And I'm saying, yeah, it's not necessarily true. Like I, I miss people. Um, and at the same time, I happen to live with my family. I have a wife and two kids. And, you know, I love being around them. And sometimes I, I wish I had some more time alone because nobody's leaving the house. <laughs> um, so all of that stuff is true. Um, we've been really good about having dinner together, like just having one good meal a day with everyone sitting around the table. And it's been that has been very good for my stress uh, and I think for everybody else's too. So you, you, you do what you can with what you have. I, I want to add um, another thing that I just um, remembered and I think it was from what Josh said when he was on earlier. Um, about, you know, everybody getting a gift from Oprah. And um, sometimes I find that it's really helpful to me and my mental health when I can figure out something nice to do for somebody else. And something really little even, like, um, like sending people, um, you know, a postcard or a letter or, um, <laughs> or, um, <laughs> like Nicole was just showing you. Um, thank you. It brightened my day. Uh, um, thank you. Um, or, you know, just, you know, buying somebody some flowers or picking some flowers if you have some at, at home or where you live and giving them to someone who isn't expecting it. Um, but those little acts of kindness um, or, or thinking about what little act of kindness I could give somebody else. Um, in this time of you know pandemic it really means way more to somebody when you can do something like that and it puts them in a good mood and then the gift you've given to yourself as well is that you can feel good about what you've shared and that helps too so giving gifts and getting gifts or little kindnesses back and forth I think that's what creates community and it helps people through a really hard time. You know, um, gifts don't have to cost money. They can be an email. They can be something you have that you share, like, you know, 
um, if you have some tea or you have something, an idea for a book or an I that they can read or something on TV they can watch. It can be anything you share with somebody um, that can just put them in a good place or know that they're being thought of, know that you they matter to you um, and that you care about them. So I'd just say that that's something to think about too. You know, I've also been inspired by my kid, right? So she's, she's 10 and um, she's been having virtual sleepovers with her best friend. And so they, they watch a movie together. They will cook together. You know, they'll make like little cookies or something. And then they are in their sleeping bags on the couch and then wake up in the morning <laughs> and connect. And I thought, you know what, some of this, the, the, the simplest things are, are from our kids, our kids teach us, right? So even if we don't have them in our home, we have oftentimes in our families and our communities. So looking to, to kids for inspiration of what they're doing, if they can still laugh, if they can still be present, um, I think that's been really powerful. Um, one other thing that um, has been helpful for me, there was a question given to Josh around, um, how do you not be a workaholic, right? So especially when your work is in your home, it's really hard to turn it off. I am guilty of that myself. So one thing that I've been doing is just a little routine of just walking out my door, walking around the block and coming in, even if it's raining, it just means like my day is done. I'm coming back home now, right? So you can do that in an apartment. You can do that, you know, wherever you are, stepping outside and going back in, it sounds really silly, but um, it can it can give you that break to know I'm done. The work will be there. I'll get there in the morning. Yeah. That's really great. I it makes me think of when this first started. One of the things I was challenging with or challenged with was not having that time to transition. So usually I'm at home, I mean, at work, and then I'm driving home at least an hour in traffic. And although I do not miss traffic, I do miss that, um, that quiet time to be able to be with my thoughts, listen to music, um, and it lets me know like I'm no longer working, it's time to go home. So I, I love that idea of creating that transition, creating transitions from one activity to the other. Um, I think that's a really great idea. Let me try that. Been helpful. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, what's your go-to jam? What's your song that if you're feeling blue or feeling really irritated at the person not wearing a mask or, you know, whatever it is, or your, or your family member, what's a song that kind of transitions you emotionally? Oh. Or kind of music. It doesn't have to be a specific song. Um, hold on, I think of a different song. <laughs> you know, um, I think that this time during this time, I, I really haven't been listening to music at all because it for me right now, it doesn't feel helpful. It feels too chaotic and adds to the noise everywhere. And so for me, I'm really cherishing like things being more quiet. Um, for me, that's what's helpful right now. Um, and when I get in the car to go to the grocery store, it's such a short trip. There's not really time for music. Um, so I, I guess I, I, don't have, I, I don't have that answer right now. <laughs> Um, for me, it's just, I think I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying some parts of the pandemic in that things are slower. So um, there's some quiet when I need it to be quiet. Um, I can't hear the traffic anymore where I live. Um, that feels really nice to me for right now. There, there are some things that have come out of it I wasn't expecting. I think right now I've been listening to, I love what you said around the quiet. I've been listening to um, the, the birds, <laughs> which I feel a bit louder than ever. Um, I, 
super excited that we're not around as much, um, but I'm more present to that. But I also, I love India Iri. So anything that that is like a soothing, just touches me in a certain way. Um, you know, my dad's Jamaican, grew up in Kingston, born the same year as Bob Marley. So we had Bar Bob Marley playing a lot as a kid. So Three Little Birds, Don't Worry About a Thing because every little thing's going to be all right. That is the song that instantly puts me into the like, okay, whew. then I get in my little hammock, you know, it's a good time. But, um, also, my family knows when that song is playing that they give me lots of space. <laughs> <laughs> Darlene, you got a song? Well, you know, I don't necessarily, I don't think I have a song I would like to share, but I have an artist, um, Toby, I think is um, N-W-I-G-E, Nuegue, Nuegue. Um, I love all his stuff, and it is amazing, like, kind of, I would say, like, India Ari with just a little bit more probably rap, kind of, like, hip-hop. Yeah, he's really good. I love him. Um, the song that I really am enjoying right now is called Hella Black. And um, that gives me a little bit of bump. So, mm -hmm. that's what I've been so people are putting in on the chat all kind of recommendations of things that they're doing that works for them, as well as songs, because that's what I was going to ask next. So I'm super glad that it's that we're doing that. Can we also put that in the Q&A? So I'm going to read what people have read have, have added so far. So we've got, um, ooh, good ones. Personally recommend journaling during these times. Yes, um, because we're living history right now, right? Also, it, you know, it just helps to get our, our thoughts out, you know, helps to reflect and think and manage thoughts and feelings. Yes, exactly. Um, I love this. Uh, Frankie, don't stop till you get enough. Yes. Um, Sympat Sympathique by Pink Martini. Um, I know that I'm not saying that right, but my forgiveness, please forgive me. Um, this is the best. Okay, go to this shall pass. So it sounds like a gospel song. Um, that does sound good. And then let's see. Okay. I'm going to do what is coming suggested and get outside. Thanks, everyone. Um, a, depress a depressing French song that sounds super upbeat. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like life right now? You know what I mean? It's like kind of sad, but we're just like putting a little upbeat. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of life right now. Um, I'd love to hear more. Keep, keep them coming. What's working for you? Keep them in the Q&A. And then while you're, you're coming up with things or we're waiting for, for our participants to, to give their input, um, Gloria, you had a, a, a point about there's some unusual um, positives that have happened, things that you were surprised about through COVID. And that doesn't mean that we're trying to say COVID is great, like by no means. But are there moments of surprise or moments of opportunity that you've had or experienced while having to, to stay at home? Um, well, I have actually, I have a couple things more I can add. Um, I, I think the silence thing has been really, um, that's been just helpful for me, realizing that I need maybe a little more silence than what I thought. Even though I'm an extrovert, um, I think as you age, sometimes you kind of develop that other side of yourself. And, um, and I'm really becoming more introverted in some ways. I like a little more reflection time and Sometimes I need to be away from people for a time. Um, so I think I've been more in tune with how I'm changing in some ways lately. Um, and then I've been, um, it, it always is helpful for me to remember that the thing that usually gets me through lots of things in life is humor. And trying, when, once I get over the shock and the, and the, you know, like, oh my gosh, the, the anxiety, then I moved to, okay, really, if I can find some humor in this. So I've been looking at the cartoons in the New Yorker um, that are online that you can find. Um, I found something on Facebook um, for um, 
um, a friend of mine, she's really into Tolkien. And so there's, there was this image of the uh, black and white image of um, the, uh, um, what do I want to say? People going on the fellowship um, uh, during the Lord of the Rings. And um, so in the, the, um, the signage underneath it said that Middle Earth is temporarily banning fellowships of more than five. And so, um, and so, and they had all these people, all four of them lined up with their swords. And so all you could see was just the silhouettes of them. So I thought, oh my gosh, that's a brilliant um, thing. And so I, um, I just painted it um, uh, for my friend who's a Tolkien fanatic. And, um, and I sent it to her in the mail because I thought it was hysterically funny. And she, of course, when she got it, thought it was hysterically funny too. So I've just been doing kind of little, little things like that, like looking for where there's humor in the midst of the sadness, because um, it's really both, just like all the rest of life is, right? It's got moments of real joy and, and moments of connection with others and shared kind of um, experience and, um, and it's got, you know, periods of sadness um, and periods of, um, you know, sometimes when I can find some humor that just helps. It helps tie it together or let me know that um, there's other ways I can release the tension and, um, and move forward. Because um, really, we don't really have a choice. We have to kind of figure out how to get through this through various means. Um, and, and just get to the other side somehow. So, so I think that, um, I think I like to do creative stuff, but, but looking for humor in things every once in a while helps me. If you were to look at my Netflix feed right now, it would just be comedies. Cause I just can't do anything serious or just rom-coms, right? Like just lifetime movie kind of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think what's also, I found interesting is to get to know my family better because you know they're at work or school all day and it's interesting to find out like oh they have like a school voice <laughs> they have a work voice you know like huh interesting you know or watching um you know little moments where my my husband might be in a video call being very serious you know and the cat comes across you know <laughs> he's trying to make a point and the dogs all you know and and actually it's been fun to watch um people's humanity people's like we get a window into people's lives i mean we get to do that as therapists all the time but even with our colleagues being on zoom we get a little window into who they are um but also the people around us so you know we're therapists we love to know what you know people's so we get a little bit more of it. I think it's helped me develop a little bit more empathy for, uh, like for my husband and the work that he does. Because um, I always feel like he, he doesn't work like I work. But <laughs> being you know, being able to work together and share that space and really trying to figure things out is, it's been an interesting um, journey. Not bad at all. It's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many pleasant surprises from the last 10 weeks or so? The other thing I've noticed is too how I'm um, eating differently because I don't want to shop um, as much. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I've, uh, you know, just um, choosing to eat a little differently with, um, you know, more, more veggies coming into the house, a little less cookies, um, and, um, and trying to really um, uh, just kind of minimize the trips to the grocery store mostly. Um, and be more thoughtful about what we're going to get. Um, because before I was just like, you know, uh, just doing whatever I felt like going to the grocery store more than twice a week usually. And now I, we're not doing that. We're being more simplistic about things. And, um, 
and I like it better. Um, I'm and I'm started thinking like, oh my gosh, when we transition out of this, how am I going to keep some of my good habits um, with me when we go back? You know, to being at you know in the physical office. Um, you know, at the college. You know, I I'm I'm hoping that I can make that transition easier for myself. But I will like, as Darlin said, I will like that ride to and from work because it really helps me do the same thing, kind of sort stuff out, get ready for the day, and then debrief at the end of the day. So, you know, when I get home, I can just do home stuff. And now it's, it's a little harder for that, um, those boundaries. Well, I can't say I'm eating better. <laughs> but I am learning to cook more. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we bought this huge bag of flour that I thought there's no way we'll be able to get through. And well, a couple dozen cookies later and some loaves and all kinds of stuff. But even that is, you know, there's a, a simpler kind of quieter um, pace of life that, I'm in, that I am enjoying. Um, and then we'll have to think about what that transition looks like when we go back. So, um, but I think collectively, at least for me, I needed that slowing down. Yeah. Quiet. So someone wrote in um, that they're sewing masks and that makes them feel better because it feels like they're less helpless and they can do something to help. And plus it's a great creative outlet too for, yes, Robin, that is an awesome idea. You get to be creative but also feel like you have a, a sense of purpose and that kindness. Um, because I know that my, there's somebody in my neighborhood um, who was making masks and I, I don't know how to sew. So that was like, that was a huge gift um, for me. So thank you for doing that. It literally is life-saving and fun, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah. I too cannot sew, but my mom has been making masks. So I know we've been at this for a while, <laughs> since about noon. Um, we're going to stay with you for a little bit longer. Uh, we might go a little quiet, but please, if there's any questions or things that you're thinking about, we're here for you. Um, or any ideas that you'd like to share with the community of things that have worked for you, we'd love to hear that too. Um, also, if you have any suggestions for us, for ways that we can be, um, you know, more available to you or in different ways, we would love to hear that too. Um, we're thinking of you. So we're just going to give some space for some Q&As right now. We might go a little quiet, but we're here. Hmm. Any words of wisdom, Gloria? I'm just thinking. If, thinking. if there's anything more that um, that I have inside me to share, <laughs> I think I think that's pretty much my my contribution at this point. But um, yeah. Funny, as therapists, we, we spend a lot of time listening. <laughs> so for us to be on, you know, kind of on stage or, or presenting or speaking for long periods of time is pushing us out of our comfort zone. I know I've learned a lot from this process. Um, so thanks for your patience with us. Yeah, I'm glad that we did this just because um, it's nice to do something all together with all of us and um, and work together this way, e even though it's a really unfamiliar technology for me. Um, and like you said, it's kind of our first endeavors in this area. But, um, you know, the, the good thing about it is, maybe that's another good thing about the pandemic, is um, it's made me become a little bit more tech um, functional. Uh, 
are, or at least now I can articulate the questions I have about my technology a little better. So I'm more apt to get a good answer from Vince or someone else about what I need to do or what I can do. Um, so that part's good. And, um, and, you know, I was thinking that even when we go back to the office, you know, now that we can all do things on Zoom, you know, maybe we'll have some you know, Zoom, you know, things that we can offer to students. Because um, if we can do um, do a little webinar once a week or something mm -hmm. like that, it's not, it, it's doable to do that. So, or maybe a Zoom with a few people, that's, that's easy to do now. So I just think that I didn't have that knowledge before this all started. So now I do, and that's um, that's kind of a cool thing, just to have learned something new. It makes life less boring when you can do something different, or um, or just acquire a new skill or a new you know piece of technology. Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm I'm fully tech um, savvy, but maybe more <laughs> tech aware. <laughs> kind of a step getting there. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you're muted, Darlin. <laughs> All I said was, I know it's a struggle. <laughs> it's real. It's real. I also wanted to add about that, too. Um, I know some people are kind of turning off their video and that, um, get, especially just as a way to cope, and I think that's okay. <laughs> You know, um, I know some instructors have different policies around that, especially around maybe taking exams, having to see you, um, you know, but communicate with your faculty. And I think there are moments where it Zoom does drain you, right? So we have to take, take breaks from that, uh, maybe turn the screen off for a little bit and still stay engaged. But um, yeah, th that's important. It's a whole different level of being present and being on and having uh, to be present, to be on, to be aware, looking at yourself. It's a whole other level of like stress, <laughs> you know, of, um, of being in Zoom in that way. So that's not something I would have known prior to this um, experience because I didn't really spend that much time in like a professional setting in, on video like this. FaceTime, sure, with my friends, but not in this capacity. So before we close for the day, counselors, maybe Vince, Aisha, if you're still on, any closing thoughts for our, for our community? I would like to share that um, I really do, you know, I know all of us really do um, just appreciate your willingness to um, trust us with some of the, like with your life, with your story, with your experiences, and want to continue to be here. Um, and even as we share our, I'm thinking about even, even as I share my own experiences, I recognize like the privilege that I have to be able to work from home and that I still have my job and that I do have a supportive, safe environment. Um, that I'm living in, right? And so we acknowledge that that's not the reality for everybody. And to the best of our ability, we wanna be there to be able to support you and to help you. Um, and you may not at this time be able to see what's a positive experience or something coming positive out of this. And so just wanted to name that and um, also just reiterate that we are available and we are here to be supportive to you in your journey. Thank you. Uh, amen. And I would say too that if uh, if you have the the means to connect with us through the counseling center by phone or Zoom. Uh, this is a time when a lot of folks have more time on their hands than they have typically. And I would say, just give it a shot. There's, uh, there's no cost 
Um, in fact, if you're a student, you are paying for it. It is included in your tuition. And so uh, it, is, it is a very valuable resource. And if you've got time on your hands right now, I think there's no better time to go ahead and, and give it a try. Um, it's a tremendous resource. Vince, I know that you're the one who takes in those phone calls often, um, and you may be the first face that people see. Um, could you just let us know what that t is typically like? So if I give you a call and say, you know what, I'd love to see a counselor. What happens after that? Um, good question. We they basically help them set up the appointment. Um, I also ask a few, I'll ask a, some detailed questions to make sure that, um, number one, it is a counselor you need to meet with. And sometimes it might be someone in advising or someone in admissions or someone in financial aid. And either way, get you to those services uh, promptly, right? But if it is a counselor that you want to meet with, uh, from there, I'll go over the appointment setting process. It's basically getting your information, setting you up with the nearest available appointment possible to match your calendar. And then from there, I'll talk about the documents that I'll be sending over to you by email. Uh, and also remind you that the sessions are going to be via Zoom, or, or they can be over the phone if you prefer. Uh, they're confidential. And I, I like to say my trademark at the office is, you know, we hold your records like a doctor's office. So even if the, the president of the, of the campus, Dr. Mosby, wanted to know about you, I could not acknowledge that you exist. I can't even talk about you and without your permission. So that's what normally happens. Thanks, Vince. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We're ending a little early, but I can see our participants are kind of starting to dwindle, and I and I we've been with you for two and a half hours. So, thank you for to our interpreters. Thank you for our IT folks, our captioners. Thank you so much for what you do. Um, hang in there. We're here for you. Okay. <laughs>